our speaker today. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to welcome today um, Dr. Nadine Nolder from the University of Cologne. Um, Nadine has been working here in Orkney at the UHI Archaeology Institute with us for about six weeks um, and um, is coming towards the end of her time here, be heading back to her, her, um, her real job in, in Germany. Um, Nadine is um, the head of the Zoo Archaeology Lab in Cologne University in the Archaeology Department there, where she has been since 2015. Um, prior to that, she was a self-employed zoo archaeologist um, and has worked on various different projects um, since undertaking her PhD in zoo archaeology, again from the University of Cologne, um, where she studied the Iron Age sites, sites and landscapes in Northwest Australia. Um, and um, today Nadine's going to be talking to us about one of her projects, which is on, um, again, zoo archaeology, and it's on um, a medieval site. So I'll just hand over to Nadine and let her talk about her research there. Yeah, yeah um, Lil, and uh, thanks Ingrid for the nice introduction. Um, and yeah, I'm very pleased to um, have the opportunity to speak here uh, today about uh, yeah, some of the benefits that archaeozoology can gain from early historical sources uh, and vice versa, of course. And um, first of all, I would like to give you a short background um, on the site uh, and history what um, I'm talking about now. So, um, Okay. Oh, fine. <laughs> yeah, um, the site is uh, the Abbey of Verden. Um, it was a Benedictine uh, monastery, belongs today to the city of Essen, and that's in the western part of Germany, as you can see here. And um, yeah, it was founded as a kind of uh, laity monastery in 799 by the Frisian Ludgar um, uh, and as a base for the mystification um, of the Saxons, uh, whose empire at the time uh, yeah, bordered on the kingdom of Charlemagne or Charles the Great. Yeah, Ludgar um, chose for um, yeah, choose a flood, flood protected hill for his abbey. Um, it was surrounded by two streams, uh, that's the Mühlenbach here in the, in the north, and uh, also the Clemensborn River here in the south. In addition, the site was located above um, an important passage over the River Ruhr um, on the road to Cologne. Um, and this is here, you can see here, and also the road and the bridge. Thus, um, Verben Abbey represents an important hub uh, in the region at this time. Yeah, during um, the 9th uh, century after the death of uh, Ludger uh, in 809 and his immediate successors, uh, the, original, um, the original monastery of Verden gradually developed into, um, yeah, from a royal monastery um, into uh, an imperial abbey, which was under the, under the direct um, subordination of the emperor and therefore had to pay tax and service directly to the imperial court of um, Charlemagne. In addition, the imperial abbeys had to provide accommodation and uh, also food for the traveling monarch um, and his uh, entire uh, entourage, sorry, and uh, also the politicians and the military. And until today, um, only a few uh, Historical documents have survived from the first uh, centuries of the Abbey, but uh, remarkable are the reports um, of uh, two states of monarchs, which you can see here in the, in the timeline. This was uh, Imperial Henry II in 1017 here, and uh, also King Conrad III in uh, 1145. And this documents uh, uh, Verden's ob obligation to provide hospitality and uh, yeah, accommodation to the monarchs in later times. Yeah, after the secularization in uh, 1811, the monastery buildings were initially used as a Prussian prison 
And uh, since 1946, uh, soon after the Second World War, um, the Folkwang College of Art and Music has been situated here. Yeah, and that's um, what the former Abbey uh, is looking like today. And um, as a part of a new building, of a, a new building planned here or uh, in the southern part for the um, college um, library, excavations were carried out uh, in 2010 by the archaeology company Archbau uh, under the direction of Paul Labrand. And uh, during these excavations, yeah, features were discovered uh, that date back into the early Middle Ages and are uh, including the remains of a former pond, pond sorry, which um, was about, you can see it here, about 19 meters long and uh, 9 meters wide and formerly up to uh, 2 meters, 2 and a half meter uh, deep. And uh, it had been um, fed and dammed by the Clemensborn River coming here from the south. Yeah, and in these pond sediments, uh, numerous wooden structures uh, were found, including almost complete fish pencils, uh, one of the oldest uh, we, we have from this um, period, and uh, which could be dated dendrochronologically to the period um, between 833 and 842. And as the Clemens Run Rock flowed down from a nearby um, hill, um, the pond was um, colluvially refilled with a few, within a few um, decades. And later it was finally drained by uh, rerouting the Clement Bourne River. And also a leveling layer um, was applied in order to expand the monastery buildings uh, yeah, on the site. And um, due to the permanent moisture uh, in the pond sediments and the sealing by the leveling layer, the preservation conditions uh, for organic material were quite excellent. Um, and in addition to wood and botanical remains, uh, a large number of animal bones uh, were, yeah, from the monastery environment were found, which had been um, dumped uh, into the pond before it was drained. And yeah, this probably took place before the abbey um, yeah, was elevated uh, to the status of an imperial abbey. Um, yeah, but uh, what is unique about these finds is not only their excellent um, preservation, but also they were um, they were accumulated within a relatively short uh, time period, uh, namely a few decades or after the foundation. Uh, of the monastery, possibly between um, 813 and 850. So this is also a period from which only a few finds are uh, known until now in the whole Rhineland in our region. So uh, you can see that it's a very exciting period for us. Another um, remarkable aspect is the, um, that the foundation and the management of the abbey are temporarily coincides, coincides, sorry, um, coincide, yeah, it's a good word for me, sorry, <laughs> um, with the famous and um, for the agriculture of the time, very, very important uh, historical source, namely the Capitulare de Viles Velcrutis Imperii. And this is a text dating uh, back to around 800, and it's probably attributed to Charlemagne. And uh, it contains a series of rules and regulations, also instructions uh, on how to manage uh, lands, animal, justice, services, and general administration um, of the imperial's property and assets. And these regulations were necessary um, to ensure the provisioning of the traveling um, emperor, his entourage, and um, also the military. Yeah, um, among other things, uh, it lists uh, instructions on agriculture, on forestry, viticulture, stockpiling, woodcraft, um, horticulture, horse and dog breeding, and also animal husbandry. And that's the very interesting point for us. 
Um, and even though Evan uh, Verden Abbey was probably not yet one of the imperial abbeys in the period from which the finds are from the ponds um, originate, it can um, it can be assumed that Ludger and his successors knew the contents of the Capitulare de Villiers of these agricultural texts and uh, were also organized under the influence, influence sorry, um, of the royal regulations. So, and uh, this in turn, uh, in turn raises the question of whether and if so, to what extent uh, the aspects of livestock management mentioned in the Capitulare de Villiers can be traced in the uh, archaeozoological material. Yeah, we know from other content, uh, contemporaneous uh, text, um, textual and graphic sources that the keeping uh, and the breeding of livestock on a monastery site was definitely encouraged, uh, encouraged and uh, also expected. And one of the sources uh, I, uh, yeah, I've uh, shown here is the Gal Monastery plan, which is the earliest illustration of an yeah, idealized um, Carolingian monastery complex, showing not only the obligatory uh, sacred buildings here in the center, um, but also numerous gardens, agricultural and crop facilities, um, farm buildings for keeping livestock and also kitchens. And um, yeah, the illustration of the stables for, uh, in this case, chicken, geese, um, oxen, cows, sheep, goats, pigs, horses and mares with their foals on this plant demonstrate um, how the keeping and breeding of domestic animals on a monastery site could be imagined from the perspective of, an, of a cleric. Yeah, in um, addition to the food render um, that the abbey received from its fiefdoms, um, it is therefore con um, conceivable that Verden Abbey um, also had a similar eco uh, economic system involving animal husbandry and breeding secured to its own, uh, its own um, to secure its own subsistence. Yeah, um, so far uh, on the historical background, um, yeah, now let's turn to the animal remains. And um, yeah, as we can see here among, here you can see it, okay. Um, we find a typical, or for our, for, for Middle Europe, um, typical uh, medieval faunal spectrum with uh, yeah, common domestic species, species, namely horse, cattle, sheep, goat, pig, and dog, and uh, occupying about 94% uh, um, of the entire um, faunal material. And particularly numbers are uh, the bones of pigs and cattle, as you can see here. Uh, which uh, obviously played an important role uh, in the diet. Um, yeah, in, addi uh, sorry, in addition, um, there was a large quantity of domestic poultry, uh, namely chicken and, uh, and goose, that are only, but are also a bone of a peacock. Yeah. So, and uh, these birds had already been introduced um, to Central Europe by, uh, from India by the Romans. Um, and as you can see, game animals, uh, wild animals on the, other, on the other hand, are very rare. Only the um, bone of a hare and four bones of um, wild birds, three of swans and one of a woodcock um, were found here. In addition, only 14 remains of sturgeons uh, were found and this may uh, on the first sight seem uh, yeah, strange um, because on the one hand uh, we are dealing with sediments from, um, from a pond and uh, we would therefore assume a certain proportion of fish uh, in the diet and on the other hand um, because of yeah, because large fish rich bodies of water such as the uh, river Ruhr and also the smaller Two rivers uh, we have there were very close by, but um, yeah, we will um, return later to that again. In addition to the quantitative uh, value of the individual species uh, in relation to each other, 
Also, um, the age and sex analysis uh, make a value of contribution to indicate husbandry and exploitation strategies. Um, and this diagram here shows um, that most of the cattle survive the second uh, year um, of life and almost 60% uh, reached a minimum age of five years. Um, we can exclude the possibility that the cattle were used exclusively for meat production. Um, otherwise, we would find more prime adult uh, animals uh, that were killed when they had reached their ideal uh, slaughter weight. Uh, weight sorry. Um, yeah, slaughter profiles with many um, older cattle may also indicate uh, diary use of the animals. But um, the sex analysis, which we can see here, um, demonstrate a surprisingly high proportion of male cattle. And this means that diary use can also be excluded, um, especially the metapodials appeared on the first side rather bulk, um, typical in their length to width uh, ratio. And however, distinguishing between, you know, castrates and uh, uncastrated, uh, between castrated and uncastrated cattle, um, is a problem, especially when we are dealing with um, very small types of cattle, which are typical here for the um, for the uh, early middle for the early uh, middle ages. According to studies of um, Buja cattle, it's a very primitive cattle breed from Bosnia. Um, Metapodials um, of small cattle are rather unsuitable. Um, for the distinction between castrated and uncastrated um, males. And uh, the sex specific length width ratio has a large overlap range. So, also um, keeping, of course, uh, of uh, several uncastrated old individuals make no economic sense. Um, as uh, only a few males were needed for the, reprodu for the reproduction, and in addition, um, keeping bulls steers are uh, um, an increased risk um, for the farmer and also um, yeah, uh, the, aggressive, the aggressive rain fighting uh, within the group that would um, destabilize um, the hair structure too. So my assumption uh, was uh, therefore that these animals uh, might be um, late castrated males um, that have developed uh, a bull-like shape, more or less. Yeah, and uh, another spectrum of cattle utilization is uh, the use as broad uh, as broad animal. Um, however, we would then expect a significantly um, a significantly higher uh, proportion of pathologic, uh, pathological changes associated with the um, with the increased physical load on the joints. Yeah, but in fact, uh, such indications are only found in three bones uh, in the entire material. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, I will come back um, to the question of what purpose these older male kettles uh, had later. So, let's um, focus on the pigs. Um, yeah, we see here the collapse of the survival curse between the first, between the first and the um, the, the second year, and this refers to the slaughter of the springborn piglets um, in autumn and winter of the following year, a time when they reached um, their optimal slaughter rate. Um, and only a few animals survived um, the third year. Um, so the slaughter curve uh, therefore follows an old farmer's um, proverb that says that a good pig should have celebrated uh, Christmas and its birthday once before it gets slaughtered. Yeah, based on, on the canons, um, we have uh, 63 males and 12 female pigs, um, and only five of the males died, um, died between um, one, and a half, uh, one and one and a half year of age. Most of the boars um, were slaughtered between one and um, one and a half and a maximum of three years of age, but none of them survived uh, the fourth year. So seven of um, the sows here, the, uh, females, 
were also slaughtered, slaughtered between one and two years of age, and these were probably um, surplus animals, uh, animals um, that were not needed for further breeding. So overall, however, the age and the sex data um, show that intensive pig breeding was uh, also not um, practiced in, in the end. And in this case, one would expect uh, more older females, but we have, our, yeah, we have uh, more uh, males in this case, of course. Um, yeah, rather, um, young pigs and piglets, mostly males, um, were delivered to the eddies as food renders from uh, the fiefdoms and uh, kept there only until their, uh, their, actual, slaughter, their actual slaughter. Yeah, and um, indeed, uh, we um, yeah such deliveries to the Abbey um, from the fiefdoms can also be proven by property regis registers, uh, so-called Urbare, uh, dating back to about um, 1050. Yeah, um, so maybe some uh, words to the to the small uh, ruminants here. They also, mostly of them, uh, also survived uh, the second year of life, um, and about one third uh, of them lived beyond four age, uh, four years of age. So um, some of the older individuals may have been kept for milk and wool, maybe. So. Um, we also have dogs, as uh, we uh, saw on the, on the table. Um, dogs are represented in relatively large numbers, um, with at least seven uh, adults and one individual less than uh, eight months old. And um, um, cut marks on, uh, on a TV yarn here um, indicate a possible use of the fur, but only in this, um, on this individual. And um, further evidence, uh, for example, the use of the meat, uh, on the other hand, was not found there. So um, it was a shoulder high of, uh, uh, with a shoulder high between 48 and 60, 60 centimeters, the dogs were comparatively large. And um, comparisons with the bone measurements, uh, of, of the bone measurements with modern dogs um, of modern breeds show a good correspondence uh, in shape and size with, uh, with large poodles. Um, of course, this uh, does not mean that the dogs from the Abbey um, yeah, actually were poodles. Um, this data only helps um, yeah, to, to get a better uh, idea of the size uh, and, the, uh, and the shape. Uh, obviously, we cannot say anything about um, appearance, such as uh, code, uh, um, code names, color, or structure. Whatever. Yeah, and um, since uh, some of the dog skulls were also complete, and it, uh, or at least in parts, um, I was able to measure them and compare them also with uh, modern breeds. And all um, the, ducks, uh, the, the, ducks, the dog skulls um, can be classified as lupoid which means um, that they have a uh, yeah, long to medium sized uh, forehead, a long snout, uh, um, and uh, that they also show a barley pronounced um, stop uh, at the transition from the frontal bone to the nasal bone, which you can see here. And um, this skull shape is most comparable um, with, um, with breeds like large rupids, for example, or also uh, German Shepherds. Um, also, we found some uh, injuries on the bones um, of at least three individuals, and uh, this indicates that uh, the dog um, were not kept uh, as a kind of pet or lab dog or something like this. Um, but rather were exposed to physical stress and uh, also the risk uh, that might occur in hunting or herding uh, accidents, for example. And um, yeah, well healed fractures also indicate that uh, the dogs were possibly um, treated or at least cared for after such uh, accidents. 
And for example, we um, yeah, um, there were three tibias um, of at least two dogs that had the same injury, namely uh, a possible fracture here uh, of, the, of the fibula in this region, um, which is resulting in the fusion of the, of the fibula with the tibia. So, um, well, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that was a short overview um, of the archaeozoological results. And uh, yeah, let's now see whether and to what extent uh, these results can be matched with the written uh, guidelines from the Capitular de Villes. So um, there are a lot of um, chapters, but I will only focus on the, on the most important ones. So uh, this is, for example, chapter 21 um, of the uh, Capitular de Villes. And uh, it states that, that um, fish keeping and pounds should be encouraged, uh, encouraged and uh, implemented. And um, yeah, uh, we see the evidence of the pond and the fish fans, um, as well as the fact that the fish was one um, of the most um, frequent fasting foods in uh, monasteries, that indicates that fish were used and probably kept at Verden Abbey. Um, in addition, it is known from um, contem contemporaneous uh, monastery from the contemporaneous. It's also a difficult word for me. Sorry, monastery of Corbe that um, sturgeon, uh, lamprey, and um, also other fish uh, species were received as food render from fiefdoms uh, on the lower Elbe in northern in northern Germany. And um, Verden Abbey also had a large, uh, had large processions in um, that part of Germany, northern part, uh, in Friesland and Emsland, uh, from which a supply of fish, uh, of fish um, could have taken place. And uh, also reference to such, um, yeah, deliveries can also, no, sorry, can also uh, be found again in the former mentioned um, property registers, the Urbare, here. Um, of the Abbey, which is list the import of um, fish, including salmon, um, pike, and eel. Yeah, in fact, um, a few remains um, of uh, sturgeon have been recorded from um, from the pond in Bern Abbey. Um, whether um, yeah, whether the sturgeon was kept in the pond or fished out of the nearby Ruhr or, yeah, remains uncertain and cannot say from where it uh, originates. Um, the widespread absence um, of fishbone in Bern can possibly be attributed um, to taphonomic or excavation related causes since um, the, excavation, the excavated um, soil was neither extensively sieved or flotated. So, um, yeah, we don't know um, if this this is a possible explanation for it. But it is, um, of course, it's also possible that the fish remains um, were just dumped uh, in a completely different uh, place of the Abbey, um, which were not a part of the excavation that took um, part in, um, with, which took um, part in, which were yeah um, done in uh, 2010. So. 2010. Yeah, moreover, it's mentioned in chapter uh, 65 of the Capitular de Villes uh, that fish from the pond um, are um, to be sold while keeping a sufficient uh, a sufficient number of the supply for the supply of the imperial court, and if no royal visit um, is expected, the rest should also be sold. So um, a possible sale of fresh fish from, um, from the pond may also explain the lack um, of remains in Verden Abbey. Yeah, um, then we have several chapters which deal with uh, the uh, sufficient supply of uh, geese, chickens and eggs for the imperial court. Um, Chicken and geese uh, should be kept in large numbers at the flour mills. Um, also, the keeping of fat uh, geese and chickens available as food render is uh, re recommended in the 
uh, capitulare debilis. And uh, in addition, uh, the bailiffs must um, always ensure that uh, there are enough eggs and uh, sufficient uh, laying hens. Um, and they also um, must collect the rent or the tax in form uh, of chickens and eggs from uh, the servants and uh, the tenants. And uh, anything beyond uh, yeah, in, uh, subsistence uh, should be sold. And uh, these chapters can also be reconciled, uh, reconciled, sorry, uh, well with the formal remains, as you can see here. Yeah, and because first um, we indeed um, have a, a lot of chicken um, bones are in the uh, in the formal remains, also uh, bones of goose, um, compared to other contem uh, contemporaneous uh, and younger sites with uh, no uh, monastic uh, context such, such as uh, the motto or motto uh, of Haus Meer here and the castle in Europe. Um, yeah, not only for the, uh, for the king uh, and his entourage, but also for the monks and the abbey, uh, chickens and eggs were very important as food renders from the fiefdom as uh, well as their own keeping and breeding of them, since eggs and uh, egg dishes were served uh, daily at the Benedictine uh, monasteries. Furthermore, um, most of the chicken and geese from Berlin Abbey were fully, were fully grown, um, so it can be assumed that, they, um, that there was an intensive, intensive keeping of lying hens. So, um, another chapter, chapter 35, deals with pet, uh, with pet exploitation of uh, mutton, pigs, and musk oxen, or fatten oxen. Fatten, oh, yeah, or oxen, yeah, fatten oxen. Um, and each country estate is subordinate uh, to the imperial, um, had to, de to deliver uh, the pet of two uh, fatten oxen per year to the imperial palatinate. And in fact, uh, the comparatively high age uh, and the predominance of male uh, in the capital probably yeah, all castrated uh, animals point to a focused fattening um, of the capital. Uh, even it cannot be uh, completely ruled out, out that it's uh, rather unlikely um, that the cattle could have been broad animals um, as uh, only two bones showed, um, or three bones uh, only uh, showed this arthritic, arthritic uh, joint diseases, uh, which indicating increased work um, activity. And um, furthermore, we have uh, also um, pollen analysis, which show uh, the presence of oaks uh, in the surrounding area, which may have uh, served as forest pasture for uh, the pig fattening. Yeah, and until the 19th century, it was a very common practice to use oxen uh, from the third to the eighth year of uh, age uh, for working and then um, for uh, fattening them, uh, them in order to achieve a higher accumulation um, of fat since the increased um, growth of muscle meat could no longer be expected in all the animals. Um, in addition to the, um, to the extraction of uh, animal fat, which is an essential uh, component in human nutrition, um, the main purpose uh, of fattening oxen was uh, the production of the valuable um, tallow, which was uh, used as, for example, as uh, fuel for tallow lamps and uh, candles, as well as for the production of salves and soap. Yeah, the, um, just think about uh, the numerous candles and lamps needed for the religious uh, cer ceremonies uh, or the work in the writing and the copying chambers um, in the monasteries. So, um, even, the, um, even the often cited cleanliness of uh, the monks was eventually only made possible by the production um, of soap from tallow. 
So uh, it's therefore hardly surprising that the price of tallow um, was often higher than the price um, for meat until the 19th century. Hence, um, there's a strong evidence that older male cattle we see in the faunal material uh, were castrated and fattened to ensure the required, uh, the, the required uh, deliveries of tallow to the imperial court. Yeah, chapter 40 describes the keeping of fancy birds uh, such, uh, such as uh, peacocks, patients, uh, ducks, uh, pigeons, petridges, and also turtle doves. Um, as a symbol of immortality, the peacock was probably, probably given special attention uh, in monastic contexts. And uh, here in Warden Abbey, um, the peacock is verified by a scapular fragment. But um, whether it was, it was um, kept um, yeah, as a, only as a, for um, a decorative uh, purpose, as a decorative pet, uh, and for the honor of God, of course, um, or whether it, it, um, it was eventually ended up on the, on the plates of the monks, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, and even, um, even through, they, through um, they are not explicit, explicitly mentioned, sorry, in the Capitulare de Villas, um, the record of swans um, could possibly also have been kept as um, the recorded, sorry, the recorded swans uh, we saw in the in the table um, could possibly also have been kept as fancy birds at the time. Yeah, let's come to regulation um, on dogs. And according to an early um, church law, monks were um, not allowed to hunt, uh, which also included the keeping of hunting dogs. Um, obviously, the monks uh, in Verden Abbey respected the ban on hunting. Otherwise, we um, yeah we would certainly have found uh, more wild animal animals among uh, the fauna remains um, than just uh, the single bone of the head. Yeah, dogs were considered as um, a status symbol um, of the nobility and therefore an indicator of uh, world of worldly worldly lifestyle which was rejected um, in the clerical worldview. Um, this uh, naturally raises the question of yeah, why, or despite of the ban uh, on keeping dogs, uh, we find such a high number uh, of them in a monastic, uh, on a monastic context like Verden Abbey. Um, and again, uh, we have a possible explanation uh, in the regulations of the Capitulare Divinis. Uh, in chapter 58, um, where uh, it is described that young dogs uh, should be given to the bailiffs and the monasteries for rearing, feeding, housing, and caring for. Yeah, one had to know uh, that Charlemagne was a uh, um, very passionate hunter, and since the monasteries were largely self sufficient, and uh, in agricultural production and uh, could therefore provide sufficient, sufficient nutrition for many dogs and also uh, space for large kennel facilities. Um, Charlemagne was out further ado instructed his palatinites and imperial abbeys yeah, to keep his packs of hounds for his royal hunting expeditions. In addition um, to uh, limiting the risk of epidemics and uh, the distribution of several Packs um, uh, of hounds uh, throughout the empire ensured a sufficient supply of hunting dogs for the traveling king and his uh, entourage. And moreover, this was um, the cheapest solution, at least for the imperial court, um, as the costs for feeding uh, and keeping the dogs were simply passed uh, from the royal court and the king on the uh, bailiffs and the monasteries. And as you can imagine, this led to um, yeah, to many complaints from the disadvantaged uh, over time, so that this uh, law was uh, repealed again in the uh, in the late Middle Ages. Yeah, and um, the dogs from Bergen um, were relatively large, as I mentioned before, 
um, and have characteristic that show similarities uh, to side hounds, um, also shepherds and pointing dogs, and traditionally such types of dogs um, that are still used for hunting today. And um, there are uh, also healed, there were also healed injuries on the bones which could have been caused by hunting accidents. So I think the requirement um, to dock, um, um, yeah, to dock packs for royal hunting expeditions is a good um, explanation for the presence of dogs in the Verde Abbey here. Yeah, um, in summary, the focus um, of the Capitular de Ville is laid on um, the provision of the provisioning um, of, of the Palatinates and the traveling um, king with his court by the imperial uh, estates and uh, abbeys. And consequently, the economic, uh, the economy of uh, the estates was based on a uh, surplus production of goods in order to be self-sufficient uh, on the one hand and to compensate uh, for possible visits by the traveling king um, and his court, including military, on the other. Um, even though um, the Ludgerian Abbey of Werden was not yet one of the imperial abbeys in the first half um, of the 9th century, the faunal remains from the Carolingian um, pond uh, in Werden um, can certainly, can certainly um, be linked to some um, of the regulations formulated in the uh, Capitulare de Villes, including the required mask of oxen and also the, the extensive keeping of poultry and dogs. Yeah, and thanks for your time. Thank you very much for the fascinating. Um, I think we will have questions, but I don't know how we go about do we have people who are off screen? Or I can check how if this, there's any questions. Yeah. I just um, wanted to make sure we have the people who are not with us asking questions too. Yeah, and so while you're doing that, does anyone have a question for Nadine in the room? Probably. Ben. Another question, yeah. Um, and I'm not a, I'm not an evil archaeologist, but uh, sorry. In, in kind of England, there's some interesting ideas circling at the moment in terms of Middle Saxon reformulation of the economy towards vellum production for monasteries. So, re restructuring the enclosures and like some quite interesting cattle slaughtering patterns emerging in terms of animals which don't seem to fit into traction or prime meat bearing. Yeah, is that is that something that plays a role in, in, in terms of Germany and, and, the, and the Charlemagne Empire in terms of vellum production and where those materials come the, from? The what part in production? Vellum, so it's the skin-based paper that monks are writing. Um, yeah, also a good um, uh, a good point. Yeah, I never thought about um, the, the vellum production. Yeah, um, I, uh, I quite don't know um, if it's a uh, yeah, um, if we found some um, some hint for it, I don't know if there yeah. are. Yeah, there are. And I, I'm not sure yeah. if it's also um, if it's cattle or if it's uh, uh, rather a sheep or goat uh, which you use for it. I'm not sure. I think it's cattle, but it, yeah, they are younger. Too tend to be calf, to be younger. Yeah. So the amazing work with working out existing parchments, the vellums and what. Species there, they'll show a combination of yeah. different species. Um, and if there are any documents in association with this abbey, it's just an amazing work you're doing to work out what species in your archaeology or mass archaeology to work out what species the pages are and relate that back to the world of that species. So, I assume this is very cheap these days, so if there are any documents and if you have permission, uh, but yeah. Um, yeah. There were no questions in the chat, but I wrote a message in the chat to say that you know that at least we ask questions here. I'll just check later to see if they're written in here. Okay, that, that's fine. So, does anyone else have any questions in the room? Anything else? I, I do have some, but I'll see if there's. <laughs> I wonder if there's anything in any amazing historical documents we have, this, this big document from you know, so early on, whether there's any other. Uh, 
um, uses of animal products, the sorts of things that we normally are, are can't see because they're archaeologically visible. So whether you have any, you know, like some of the things we've been thinking about, like, yeah. like animal glues and, and weird ones, yeah. and things like that. Um, yeah. Um, to be honest, uh, I only focus on uh, on things which I can uh, yeah see in the in the found remains. So possibly there are some um, some hints uh, in these um, yeah in the historical document in this case, but um, I'm I'm not sure if yeah if so but possibly uh, because there are also a lot of. Um, um, yeah, uh, regulations about woodcraft and um, other um, 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 craft or mm -hmm. things, so, uh, and also virtue culture and so on. So, I, uh, yeah, maybe, but yeah. um, you have to go uh, deeper into the into the sources. Which is, I didn't. Um, is it available in English? That yeah. uh, maybe there is a translation. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Um, I check it for yeah, you. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Um, Jean? Um, I was really interested in um, what you were saying about tallow, and it was making me think about the importance of it right through through history and on. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering about um, the quantity of tallow that would come from a full grown yeah. beast, uh, um, an oxen, and then thinking about you know how much quantities people would use and I think feeding that back again into prehistory and seeing mm. you know how people were keeping cattle yeah. for certain ages. Um, I'm not sure about uh, the amount um, of a um, of full ground oxen um, whether, um, whether it is in tallow. Um, yeah but um, I think you can uh, figure out uh, about the um, the shoulder height, the size, and also estimations on the on the weight. Uh, what was the proportion of uh, of of tallow and fat? Um, so it's very interesting to um, to investigate. Yeah, this. Mm -hmm. I have a tiny question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just jump in. And I mean, I think it was really interesting what you, how you looked at that cattle mortality profile because mm. um, being able to relate it to the historical documents and suggesting yeah. this alternative um, use for cattle because we wouldn't normally get to that at all. No, no. Um, and, and therefore explaining it by looking at you know, the way that you did is, is really, really fascinating. And, and as Jane said, it opens up this new. Um, kind of question in, in people's heads over what were people keeping cattle for? Because we just assume it's fractured or meat yeah. or milk. But tallow is yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. a new one. Yeah, tallow is a new one. So I wondered um, in this marvelous document, is there is there a kind of discussion of how you go about rendering and processing? Do they tell? Do they kind of give you an idealized um, account of how you would then? Extract the um, No, but uh, I think it's not. Uh, it's uh, quite the same as we do it today. <coughs> so, um, you only have to melt it out and uh, yeah, wait until it's getting um, cold again, and then you have for uh, yeah, you have the tallow. I don't know if there are some um, cleaning processes or if you only use um, a special uh, kind um, of of the fat. Uh, there are quite different types, of course. Uh, and um, I'm not sure about this, but um, I guess there's no other, yeah, it's quite the same as, as we do it today for uh, different, um, yeah, um, industries, so, yeah. And also the fact that you're fattening them up. Yeah, this is a very yeah. we don't, yeah, we don't yeah. have any hints are in the um, capitularity years of how they were fattened up. Um, and only um, later sources uh, sources uh, um, show that uh, they were um, fed with, uh, with wheat or with barley, um, of course, um, to, to fatten. Um, and this would also be a very, very interesting um, point for microware analysis. Can you see um, on, the, um, on the piece uh, what, um, yeah, uh, what was the special diet of these special animals? And um, 
yeah, that's also maybe a project for the, for the future. Yeah, she knows and Nadine's been working with Echo Micro from the Olympic side in the last six weeks. So this is a potential mm -hmm. um yeah, it's really interesting to apply to this context. And I suppose it's to be perhaps a further in the future. Anyway, really interesting to look at Yeah. yeah. Um they are progress micro um, um uh, isotopes, yes. Mm -hmm. So we mm, expecting uh, the results and I think end of the year maybe. Um, is this the first time that um, you that that anyone has been able to look in this kind of detail at these these imperial estates in the Germany region, um, or does this this pattern of results sort of tie in with what's been found elsewhere? Uh, you mean the historic source? Or yeah. Do this? Um, yeah, that's a yeah well uh, investigated uh, historical source. Um, if I understand you right, uh, um, and um, yeah, but it's the first time um, um, that uh, the archaeobotany and also mm. the archaeology uh, tried to um, yeah to find or. Uh, some um, points in it uh, which uh, matched also to the um, to the um, animal remains and um, mm. in the material from this period. Okay. That's the first so are I there other imperial sites that might be able to um, investigate um, in the future? Yes. Um, um, I showed you uh, when I um, when I showed you the, mm. the, um, the table from the um, from the amount of the of the chicken. Um, there's another. Um, Quite interesting site, uh, the Crew by Hereford. Uh, it's a, a women's uh, a convent, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, quite comparable to um, to Werden uh, uh, Abbey. It's contemporaneous, and uh, yeah, um, it's also it would be good um, if um, we also got the um, the found material from there to compare them mm -hmm. again. And then can that question come in? Um, is the large number of pigs unusual for this region and compared to secular sites, for example? And does it reflect the high status nature or wealth of a site? Um, no, um, the high number of pigs is not unusual for um, yeah, middle European or um, middle medieval um, Period. So we have a high amount um, of cattle and also pig. Um, it's, um, sometimes it's more cattle but, um, and uh, less pig, or sometimes it's vice versa. Um, but um, they are the um, yeah the main um, domestic animals uh, for yeah and very very important for the for the nutrition. And um, so no, it's not a um, reflection of the of the wells. It's the it's the normal thing we see in uh, most of the medieval um, sites there. Are there supposed to be carps in ponds in monasteries? Is it car? That or is it with the carp family? Is it with the Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, they would be expected in ponds, but you need to say yes, yes, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. it, 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 yeah. is, uh, it is weird that we don't yeah. have them. Um, we would expect them there, so the Cyprinids, mm -hmm. carts, and um, so on. Um, but um, we have maybe um, a bone which could originate uh, from, a, from a pipe, but that's all the sturgeon and uh, maybe the pipe. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing more. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Okay. So maybe covering the, the if you said there was no digging. Yeah, yeah, that that's it's a very, very good reason, done. but also yeah. maybe it's completely sold or yeah, dumped off and on, on another in another place. So we don't know. I have a question about sheep. Yeah, um, I guess we're kind of in this country. Kind of we're really used to thinking about monastic establishments as having wool, wool production. I know that slightly makes sense. 
as well, it's kind of mixed for air in the mm. late hundreds, but you don't find evidence of all your production at all. No, um, in um, nearly every um, uh, medieval um, site, we only have uh, maybe 50, 10 to maximum of 20% um, is uh, the small luminance or sheep and gold. It's uh, uh, every time on the third place of, um, of the domestics after uh, cattle and pig. And um, yeah, sometimes um, um, of, you know, most of the, um, of the uh, sheep and goat um, yeah, were old animals, yes. So we, um, we get that it's a, um, there is a kind of uh, wool production uh, in, the rural, in the rural areas, uh, at least, um, but not uh, to a great, um, mm. No, not a great, uh, not a large, um, um, yeah, not intensive, not an extensive uh, wood production. No, yeah, it is. Yeah. And no more questions in the chat that I can see, but there are a few people saying thank you and great talk, really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> I think if there's no more questions here as well, we'll say thank you. Um, and in the usual way. Obviously, goodbye to people.